Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the McCain Institute's Authors and Insights. Character-Driven American Leadership for Today's Challenges, our first episode in a series of book discussions that will interview authors of newly released books on American politics, policy, and leadership. My husband, John, was a voracious reader and loved to discuss books with anybody who would listen. He fought his whole life to promote American character-driven leadership to the public. And it's incredibly important today to carry that legacy forward by any means necessary. Today, we are honored to host Robert Zellick, a dear friend of my husband and a seasoned foreign policy expert with expertise ranging from the White House to the World Bank. I look forward to hearing about his book, America in the World, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. Listen in as McCain Institute's Executive Director, Ambassador Mark Green interviews Mr. Zellick about the history and current standing of U.S. foreign policy. Welcome. Honey, can you get that? Okay. Uh, thank you, Cindy, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And welcome everyone to our first episode of Authors and Insights, Character-Driven American Leadership for Today's Challenges. We're interviewing prominent authors on new books on American politics, policy, and leadership. Books that affirm the importance of both character-driven leadership and American engagement in the world. Speaking of engagement, I hope you'll take the opportunity during our interview to join today's discussion by submitting questions as we go along. You can do that by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Today, as uh, Cindy mentioned, we are joined by my friend, Bob Zellick. Bob Zellick has served America and served her well across multiple administrations and in a range of key roles. In the late 80s, he served as counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury, Under Secretary of State, as well as White House Deputy Chief of Staff. In the George W. Bush years, he served as U.S. Trade Representative, Deputy Secretary of State, and later President of the World Bank. He's received numerous honors, the State Department's highest award, the Treasury Department's Alexander Hamilton Award, and DOD's Medal for Distinguished Public Service. But the American government weren't the only ones. The German government awarded him the Knight Commander's Cross, the Mexican government awarded him their Aztec Eagle, and Chile gave the Order of Merit. These days, among other posts, Bob is a senior fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. And of course, he is the author of a remarkable new book, America in the World, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. Bob, welcome. It's great to see you again. Well, thank you, Mark. It's a real privilege to be here with you and with Cindy in the first of this, uh, this, this series. Uh, I had the great privilege of considering John McCain a friend. Uh, as Cindy mentioned, uh, he a, was a hero, a leader, but also a voracious reader. So this is a, a nice way of recognizing that legacy. Well, that's wonderful. Again, it, it, it's really great to have you with us for our first in the series. So uh, beginning with the obvious. What led you to write this book? What was your inspiration? Well, like Senator McCain, uh, I always respected the work of uh, Henry Kissinger. Kissinger wrote a book a number of years ago titled Diplomacy. And in it, he used history to talk about foreign policy, uh, but it tended to be written from a European perspective. 
So for years, I've been playing with the idea of how might I do something that brought in some of the ideas and experience from the American uh, perspective. And so the, uh, the structure or the approach I took in this book is uh, in the same way that, that Cindy mentioned, is to focus on characters and individuals and leadership. So I focus on people and events and the practical work of diplomacy. So I suppose one of the other purposes I had is that the, the, the field of diplomatic history, as it used to be known, has faded a little bit over the years. And for understandable reasons, people have tried to bring in different types of perspectives and actors and, and, uh, and ideas, but it led to a bit of a fragmentation. And I wanted to try to draw those back together. Uh, there was a history professor at, uh, at Harvard, who's now going to have a good book out on John F. Kennedy, a new biography. And he wrote a piece saying, why have we stopped teaching political history? So this is a way to come back a little bit to biography and political history. And I suppose, Mark, the other point was, insofar as those subjects are still taught, they tend to focus more on the post-World War II era. And I wanted to go back to the first 150 years of America, because there's a lot of interesting characters and people. And then perhaps one other benefit which is in many of those years, the US didn't have overwhelming power. Uh, I heard former Secretary Mattis comment recently that he was, he was troubled that the United States didn't have total domain dominance. Well, in much of our history, we didn't have total domain dominance, so we still had to conduct diplomacy. So those are some of the, the ideas behind the book, and I've tried to focus on uh, methods of diplomacy as, as well as some of the people and ideas. Yeah, and actually, I'm going to pick up on that, that last point you just made. So uh, maybe a slightly contrary point of view. I actually think that the subtitle of this book, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy, in some ways, that's not quite on the mark, because as I see it, it it's less a history and more a diagnosis. You know, may, maybe what we really have in this great book is that we have an explanation for uh, modern audiences of, of what the various strands of U.S. diplomacy are. What do you, I mean, does that make sense to you? Well, yes, I, uh, many books about foreign policy, understandably, are, are written by scholars and they wanna come up with intellectual frameworks or, or, or themes. And I wanted to let the characters tell the story. And, and in the process, revive some of the ideas uh, of that experience that have influenced American foreign policy. As you see in the stories, some of them come back. Uh, so the question is, you know, they may, may reappear again. Um, and, and just to give you, you know, two uh, sort of very different examples, one of my early chapters is on Alexander Hamilton, where I wanted to talk about economic statecraft, uh, but also how he connected that diplomacy to the economic design and strategy for the United States. But a hundred years later, I involve a character that many people will not have recalled, Charles Evans Hughes, even though he almost won the presidency in 1916 for Woodrow Wilson. And that's a story about arms control, naval arms control, but also regional security. And yet I think there's lessons one can draw from that for topics as diverse as North Korea or Iran today. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting to me that what the book tells me, it, it, it isn't a neat progression. You have a chapter of this doctrine or this tradition, turn the page and go to the next one. As you point out, themes come in and go out, and there's a constant interplay. You know, um, just about every review that I read of your book includes the following sentence from page nine of your book. Quoting, over 200 years, U.S. diplomacy has sought out what works, even if practitioners stumbled while discovering what they could accomplish. Uh, so that's obviously uh, a, a push for pragmatism. But I'm going to suggest that um, I, I think a, a, a better or perhaps more nuanced um, encapsulation of the book is this quote on the same page. Dwight Eisenhower calm the fever, the fever pitch of the early Cold War, preparing prudently for the long haul. JFK learned to deal pragmatically with crises. Ronald Reagan set ambitious goals, 
yet was willing to negotiate and accept step-by-step -step results, George H.W. Bush combined bold moves with careful restraint and constant diplomatic outreach to end the Cold War peacefully and then organize an unprecedented coalition to reverse Iraq's aggression in the First World War. So really, it, it is less a, a neat progression of traditions and more a constant interplay of traditions depending on the leader and depending on the circumstance with different traditions uh, perhaps taking, uh, taking the day. Yeah, the, well, I, I decided it would, it would have been an overwhelming task to write a full comprehensive history and probably would have been less readable. I partly designed this for people who enjoy biographies, as John McCain enjoyed biographies, because I think people are a way you bring these stories to life. But as, as you know, Mark, for each person, I tried to associate it with kind of an episode or a, 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 a brief era of, of issues as well as uh, an idea. So I try to associate Hamilton with economic statecraft. For Jefferson, it's the futurist because of his view uh, ahead. For John Quincy Adams, it's sort of American realism. Um, and so I try to come up with a, with, a, with a menu, if you would like, of ideas that I think uh, people thinking about foreign policy today could look at and say, oh yes, does, you know, how does that one show up here? Yeah, and at the same time, you've got leaders like Ronald Reagan and Teddy Roosevelt known for sort of soaring rhetoric and, and big vision and city on a hill. And yet, when you look at their greatest accomplishments, it was oftentimes that which occurred behind the scenes was incremental and where they had to nudge things along, probably with some impatience, but in terms of accomplishment, their greatest accomplishments. Yeah, well, Teddy Roosevelt's a good example. Uh, if you uh, if you think about Teddy Roosevelt, we often associate him as the lieutenant colonel who went up San Juan Hill or the Great White Fleet. Indeed, uh, if you go to the Roosevelt Room today, uh, you'll see this picture of Colonel Roosevelt on a steering horse. This is in in the white the West Wing of the White House. But below it is the Nobel Peace Prize, and he won that Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 1905 1906 for mediating the Russo-Japanese War. And that's interesting because um, he, while one often thinks of him in terms of, of uh, his, his bully aggression, he used that discipline as a mediator extraordinarily effectively. And this was at a time that the US didn't really have a diplomatic service. So part of what Roosevelt does is he, he enlists the support of the, the German, the French ambassadors to the United States, uh, a groomsman who was uh, a British diplomat serving in St. Petersburg, they want to work with him because they can see he's a guy who gets things done. He's got a magnetic approach. And by the way, I think that was one of the great skills of our, our alliance leaders, is try to pull other countries to our side. Um, I also include in that one the, the first Moroccan crisis, which he mediates. He does that quietly because your, your predecessors in the Congress didn't want him being in European affairs. And it's an interesting little incident. Most people would have never heard about it. But yet, if you think about it, it's one of those brewing problems on the periphery of Europe that could have led to a conflagration, just as it did in the Balkans in, in less than a decade. So uh, it's a good example of, of uh, sort of his, his skill set, but also how he pulls people together. In the case of Reagan, you know, I think many of us admired Reagan, but we've often tried to try to have a sense of, you know, what was the particular skill? And I went back and looked closely at Reagan's political career. For people that follow politics, they'll often know that he was most noted for, quote, the speech, which is a 1964 speech that he gave uh, in Goldwater's doomed political effort. And it represented how Reagan came to terms with ideas. And in a sense, he was fighting the Cold War as a battle of ideas. But in all those years when he was out of office, he was quite a careful writer of radio scripts. And he would delve into subjects he'd think through, and then he'd articulate them <clears throat> in his writing and his speaking. And he was a friend of mine who served as a staff secretary, unfortunately now passed away, said, Reagan was often noted as the great communicator, but in fact, he was the great editor. He was a very skillful writer. But then, and most historians have a hard time quite understanding, well, how do speeches sort of make the policy? 
And I think the speeches were key to Reagan's focus and conviction on, on sort of big ideas, but they also had to be combined. And this is a point you alluded to. I bring in Secretary Schultz into this chapter because Reagan, while great at articulating his position, also loved negotiating, as did Schultz. And so I explain how the two of those items fit together. And I draw one other point. Uh, President Reagan was not a detail man. And so in parts of his administration where the people in charge didn't serve him as carefully uh, as in Iran or the Middle East, there could be trouble. But as you saw with Schultz in uh, foreign policy and my former boss, Jim Baker, in the first term with the domestic agenda and the second term at the treasury, those become key uh, subordinates. And I think that's another piece of the story you can see uh, Roosevelt built his own subordinates. Wilson lacked those subordinates, Woodrow Wilson. So I think that's also part of an effective foreign policy team. Yeah, so in some ways, it's less about, uh, strictly speaking, pragmatism and more about something that, uh, that Mario Cuomo once said, you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. And maybe that's what we have here as a foreign policy and diplomatic equivalent. Yeah, what I wanted to stress on the pragmatic side is that um, many of the books on foreign policy try to put things in, in categories or models. Um, and what I was trying to explain to people is when I was dealing with German unification in 1989 or the trade policy or Darfur or others, the, the models of realism, idealism or offshore balancing or other issues, they don't take you very far. And so I was trying to suggest that my experience, as well as my study of foreign policy in the United States, emphasize that people go beyond the intellectual abstractions to the messy facts of, of trying to solve problems and sort of bringing experience to bear. And there's a, there's a sense of this where, of course, the most skilled pragmatists have a sense of power on the ground, whether economic, military, technological votes. They also have a sense how processes and institutions work and how they can sort of get them to accomplish uh, their aims. Um, they also have a sense of the position of other parties. I mean, you know this as a member of Congress, as the head of AID, how do you get other people to sort of get things done? Um, and also perhaps uh, accept that you get imperfect results in a far from perfect world. Uh, but uh, that's the, the way the practice really occurs. You know, the uh, core of your book, of course, is what you refer to as the five traditions of American foreign policy. And uh, you can't help but note, you didn't say the five doctrines of American foreign policy or the five schools of American policy. You did that very purposefully. Yeah, well, I tried to uh, pull the stories together with some of these traditions that appear over time. So, and, and the first one is one that I share with Senator McCain but you wouldn't hear often in most foreign policy discussions, which is the importance of North America. Right. Well, you know, obviously in the 19th century, and particularly for Arizonans, uh, this is a pretty important part of our, of our history with our neighbors and our, and our borders. Um, also in the 20th century, I mean, we almost went to war with Mexico again in 1916. The Germans tried to draw Mexico into World War I to take back Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. For some reason, they left out California. Uh, if you think about the Cuban Missile Crisis, the big nuclear showdown, the Cold War, that's taking place in the Caribbean uh, in, in the same uh, sphere. Um, if you think about NAFTA, where Senator McCain was also a leader, that was much more than a trade agreement. That was trying to reorient a Mexico changing from the one party system to a more outward oriented environment. But I would take this a step further. If you ask what many Americans are interested in today in foreign policy, they might give you topics such as immigration or topics such as uh, economic development, uh, topics such as uh, environment, uh, organized crime, narcotics uh, in the North, issues related uh, to the Arctic. So my argument is those issues have to be part of our current agenda, but I would take it one step further. Uh, I believe that a strong continental base, 500 million people, three democracies working together, that will also help the United States engage with problems around the world. It, it, it puts 1.3 billion people in China in a different perspective. And I found this reference to Reagan, which I loved in this. 
he, as he launched his campaign in 1979, he says, this is his campaign for president of the United States. <laughs> but he says, look, we'd be better off if we have Mexico and Canada being stronger. And it's time we stop treating our nearest neighbors as foreigners. Well, that's pretty different from the rhetoric that we hear today. Uh, but I think it's an important sense about how America's strength but it also builds off its neighborhood. You know, it's interesting, of the five traditions that you have in your book, I think this is the one that's often overlooked. The importance of the North American base, I, I, I think too often in foreign policy publications and discussions, people look a great distance, forgetting that the common market that is Canada, Mexico, the US, as well as other countries is of great power and great importance. You know, it, it, it's interesting when you think about it, every president up to Donald Trump and since Jimmy Carter has taken their first overseas trip to Canada or Mexico. Teddy Roosevelt went to Panama on his first trip and Donald Trump, the businessman, he may not have gone to Canada or Mexico on his first overseas trip, but his first trade deal obviously focused on Canada and Mexico. So even if it hasn't been front and center for us, it obviously has been quietly a fundamental part of our strength in our foreign policy. Well, I hope so. Uh, I think this is this will be one of the issues debated uh, because focusing on building a wall is a little different than <laughs> than than trying to unite the North American region as one one uh, set of partnerships. You know, another one of the traditions that I don't think is thought about enough is what you term as public and congressional support. Uh, obviously, most Americans think of foreign policy as solely the uh, part of the portfolio of our chief executive, but you point out that at crucial moments in our history, if it were not for the emergence of persuasive, uh, influential congressional leaders, some of the outcomes um, might have been different. And to the extent that your book has a hero, I would submit that Senator Vandenberg is probably that hero. Uh, he talked a great deal about not a bipartisan foreign policy, but an unpartisan foreign policy. So your hero? Well, he's one that I wanted to bring back from the distant myths of the past, in part for the reason you mentioned. Um, it's a theme that I tried to draw in through the chapters from the start. When I, when I look at Ben Franklin trying to negotiate uh, our independence in the Revolutionary War, I, I note the challenging relations with Congress. And in fact, uh, one of his colleagues after this very successful treaty says, don't you think it'll be met with appreciation? And Franklin responds, he said, you know, I don't know of any peace agreement that didn't find some people with complaints. And he said, I think that uh, blessed are the peacemakers belongs to the next life, not this one. Um, but I think in Vandenberg, it was part of the chapter that I wrote about the creation of the alliance system in 1947-49. And this is an area that's been, been written about, but I wanted to try to draw in some characters that were a little less known. The other one is Will Clayton, who was sort of led the, much of the economic side. But Vandenberg uh, was a newspaper editor uh, from Michigan. It turns out in some ways he was a mentor for, for Gerald Ford. He, he also wrote histories. He was a good writer and he enjoyed, he actually had great respect for Hamilton. Um, it was an interesting window, which you would know well, about the challenges uh, of, of foreign policy making from the Congress. Remember, he's a minority, a member of a minority party in the age of Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, and he really comes to the fore in terms of helping uh, Truman after 1945. Uh, he has to maintain his political standing as an opposition leader. He has to uh, be an opponent, uh, but he does it while legislating. And that chapter is full of just wonderful little insights on how he brings things together. Dean Acheson, who was Secretary of State at part of the time, uh, referred to Vandenberg's doctrine of political uh, transubstantiation, which is based on the, the Christian concept of, of communion and the transforming uh, the bread and the wine into the body and blood. But Vandenberg, uh, uh, or Atchison referred to Vandenberg of this in kind of a humorous way. He said, the way Vandenberg would work 
is that he'd start out skeptical about a proposal. Then he'd find one element, not necessarily a core one, but he'd make a big deal of it. And then he'd come up with a fix, inevitably the Vandenberg Amendment. And in the process, he'd draw together his colleagues and sort of build party support. And you can see him do this time after time. And one that I found particularly striking, you know, the, the Constitution refers to the advice and the consent of the Senate on treaties. But Congress normally comes in on the consent part, not the advice part. But in 1948, the Marshall Plan was just getting going, but it was clear that we would need a security arrangement to complement it, both to deal with the Soviets, but also reassure the French and other Europeans as Germany, the new West Germany was brought into this. And so uh, Vandenberg uh, puts together on his own, sort of he types six paragraphs of what would be a potential resolution to guide the executive branch on negotiations. He holds a couple days of closed sessions with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, just going through these six paragraphs. And in the process, outlines the approach to, to change America's historical sort of reluctance to join allies. And he's being quite careful. He's, he's trying to learn the lessons of Woodrow Wilson's failure about the constitutional authority, congressional authority, and also the role of the UN in regional agreements, because he had been a key in sort of bringing uh, the UN into form. He was a good vote counter. And as you know, uh, for an executive branch partner, it's nice to have somebody who knows how to uh, bring, bring their colleagues along. Um, and the larger point, as you identified, is that throughout American history, there are key members of Congress, often in the Senate, but sometimes, as you know, in the House, who sort of step up and play a role in this. And of course, I was thinking about Senator McCain in this. Uh, when, when I worked with Senator McCain in the 90s, this was in the Clinton administration, you know, he played a key role in the opening to Vietnam. He played a key role in building Republican support for the, the military and peace efforts uh, in the Balkans. He clearly mentored a generation or more of members of Congress with the Munich Security Conference in Singapore and others. There are other people, uh, Senators Luger and Nunn, uh, as you know, and, and you're part of this tradition, having built a career you know, across the legislative and executive branches. But it raises the question for the future, to have a successful foreign policy, who will be the members of, of the Senator House looking forward who can help play this role with a President and a Secretary of State? You stole my thunder. That was the question I was going to pose. So um, uh, something I loved in your book, I, you noted that in 1946 alone, Vandenberg spent 213 days either at UN or Council of Foreign Minister meetings in London, New York, or Paris. Uh, that would make McCain a piker. And we used to always <laughs> joke about how often he traveled. Of course, if McCain went to those locations, he'd stop about a dozen places along the way for three and four hour stops, usually in godforsaken parts of, uh, of the world. But um, I think that is an open question, isn't it? Uh, who's gonna step forward and play the McCain role, the Vandenberg role, regardless of who wins in November in terms of the, uh, of the presidency, uh, that person will need a strong partner. Uh, the other thing it does is create some sustainability in foreign policy especially if it crosses party lines. I look at some of the great accomplishments in, in my field in development from the Millennium Challenge Corporation to PEPFAR, the AIDS initiative. As, uh, as much as we all want to point out that George W. Bush authored them and drove them, he'd be the first to say that they would not have survived. They would not have been sustainable if not for dynamic leadership from Democrats in Congress. Tom Lantos and others really made a huge difference. So I, I think you're right. I think it probably is, is an open question. Um, well, also Jim Colby, another Arizonan who had, was on the Appropriations Committee. And this shows you a little bit of how it worked. When the administration first came up with the idea for the Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, I was the US trade representative and they didn't think about the connection of trade and development. So Colby and I, Colby always a great supporter of trade, we decided the US trade representative should also be part of the process. But that also is another little element I try to draw into the book. Whether it was people like Baker, my boss, uh, Charles Evans Hughes, Ella Harut, uh, 
there's a skill for executive branch officials that understand how to work with Congress, how to bring people along on these issues, just as there's an importance for people like yourself in the Congress that understand that they, they play a critical role in building longer term and broader public support. Uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, I would say that uh, my days when I was an assistant whip was probably the most important training ground for the work I went on to do as ambassador because you had to learn where people came from, what mattered to them, and how you could bring them around. Let me, let me shift because another one of the traditions, and you've alluded to it several times, is the important role that our alliances have played. Our role with and through our alliances you know, in, in some ways that, that particular tradition is under particular stress these days. And um, for many, it's, it's probably out of fashion. So if, if Vandenberg was a hero in your book, I would say that, and you have a certain bias to it, of course, the dream team in your book were those days under Bush 41, ending the Cold War through our alliances and building a coalition for the first Gulf War, those were remarkable achievements and they really uh, would not have been possible if not for the team that was built and the approach to alliances that was pursued. Yeah, there, there are a couple of elements of that, that story. Um, and of course it begins with the fact, as we've discussed, that for the first 150 years, America wants to avoid alliances because Washington warns about no permanent alliances and Jefferson says no entangling alliances. So a lot of the stories in the book are how does the United States engage without an alliance structure. But then the turn in 47, 49, in which Vandenberg was a key part of, basically creates a new type of alliance. The type of alliance system that America created after World War II is different than the old European military alliances. And Vandenberg's quite explicit on this point. He says, this is an alliance based on diplomacy, on political ties, on economics. We often think about it just because of NATO or America's military power, but underneath it is a broader sets of connections. And as you said, I think uh, George H.W. Bush, Bush 41, was in some ways a, a model alliance leader. But a lot of people didn't appreciate that while uh, Bush 41 was a careful gentleman and very prudent, he was fiercely competitive. And so he wanted to win. And frankly, with Gorbachev being the star on the international scene, uh, Bush wanted to make sure that, that he put some points on the board. And in that, the relationship with, with Baker was critically important because Baker was the action officer. Baker was there to get things done. Baker was there to sort of take the impulses and make things happen. And in this 89 period, something that many historians have overlooked because they focused on the Soviet Union, was our first question was not the Russia question. It was the German question. You know, we'd had Germany and, and the United Germany from 1871 on had been a disruptive force in Europe. So while we supported unification, we wanted to try to do so. And that embedded it in the transatlantic and the European Union structures uh, of today. And that even marked a shift in some of the priorities. Um, in the very first part of 1989, President Bush comes up with this very bold conventional forces negotiation initiative. Most histories you'll see don't even discuss it. Notice the shift from the focus on strategic nuclear arms to conventional forces. And that's because he believed that the Cold War wasn't over until the source of the problem that started it, the division of Germany and Europe was resolved. And that couldn't be done until Soviet forces uh, went home. And it also dealt with the, frankly, the appeal of Gorbachev to the Germans because the only nuclear weapons left in Europe at that time were short range missiles. And as the Germans said, the shorter the missiles, the deader the Germans. So, so it was, a, it was a, a strategy as well as kind of a, a diplomatic method. And as you say, they applied this same approach to putting together the Gulf War coalition, uh, working with the UN, but leading and driving the UN. 
And just to give you a sense of how you can tie these together, I remember that uh, Baker was quite concerned about whether we'd get the support in the Senate for the resolution uh, to go to war. And uh, he consciously believed that if we could get the UN Security Council to support us uh, in the prospect of the first Gulf War, it'd be much harder for members of the Senate not to support us. So it gave us a sense of how those two get combined. And I guess, but the one other thing about President Bush that I tried to draw out in this chapter is his historical role tends to be associated with ending the Cold War or the Gulf War. But if you step back and you look at the seeds he planted for NAFTA, the Uruguay round of trade negotiations, which creates the WTO, APEC, which is the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, Middle East peace process, frankly, the only global climate change treaty that the Senate has ratified, which I was deeply involved with, and it creates the framework for the Paris Accord and everything that flows from it. All those start in the Bush 41 administration. And so there's an irony, as there often is in history, which is if, if with a little distance of time, many of the aspects on the Clinton agenda or the Bush 43 agenda, in a sense, flow from this one term president. You know, and it's interesting uh, if we, uh, as I've suggested, have less a, a neat progression in our history, but more traditions and leaders coming in and out. You point out that after 9-11, it was a Vandenberg contribution, Article 5 of NATO, that was invoked to help us in the early days after 9-11. So again, a tradition coming in and out and making a contribution. Yes, it was actually, I think the only time it was invoked was to help defend the United States. And it shows the two-way nature of alliances. Uh, you know, um, one of the uh, topics that you touched upon, but something I know near and dear to your heart, and certainly a, a core part of your own career, is the importance of economic statecraft, trade, uh, technology. Uh, one thing you point out, uh, maybe something that is distinctive in America's approach to foreign policy as opposed to some countries, for Americans, uh, trade is about much more than money. It isn't simply about commerce, as important as commerce is, or financial commerce. It's about something much more, right? Yeah, well, this really has its origins in, in the nature of the country. So, you know, it, it, many people would not be totally unaware is that while John Adams served with Jefferson in 1776 as they came up with the Declaration of Independence, Adams chaired his own committee, which was to come up with the model treaty for the United States, this new country. And it's basically a trade treaty. But remember the context, and, and this is where history's context is really vital. It, this is, the, the United States is born in a world of, of empires and mercantilism and colonies and government state directed systems. So from the start, the United States associates liberty and private parties or what political scientists would call transnational actors, whether they're missionaries like your family or whether it was uh, economic actors or engineers or others with the notion of being part of America's presence in the world. And how do we try to, to uh, expedite that? Uh, the Navy is obviously important in opening Japan to trade and modernization in the 1850s. Uh, Secretary of State John Hay has the open door doctrine in 1899 and 90 to try to talk about America's interest in China and while the rest of the world wanted to carve China up like they just carved up Africa, the United States wanted to support China's territorial integrity. And then we have the tremendous breakdown of trade in the 1930s after the Smoot-Hawley tariff bill raises tariffs up to an average of 59% and trade drops between 40 and 60%. And that points out that trade relations can also be critically linked to economic, political, and even security stability because the world breaks into, into sort of trade blocks. Now, at that time, the, the start of the recovery comes from Secretary of State Cordell Hull, a uh, former longtime member of Congress, Ways and Means Committee, uh, long supporter of trade. He convinces uh, FDR to support what's called the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act of 1934. And any member of Congress today would be shocked. The bill's about three pages long. <laughs> but it's, an, it's, a, it's a momentous switch because it authorizes 
the executive branch to negotiate tariff reductions. And at that point, didn't even have to come back for congressional approval. This is the start of what later became fast track or trade promotion authority in the executive's role. Hull negotiates, I think, uh, 29, 28, 29, uh, or about 31 agreements with 28 or 29 countries. But as important as lowering the tariffs are, the more important part is the principles that he establishes those agreements, which become the basis of the GATT system, and later the WTO after World War II, which becomes the basis for extraordinary sort of economic growth. Now, there's a key point here, which is, and, and Hull has to deal with this, that the trade here was not managed trade, uh, as we sometimes hear today, where you're trying to get packaging agreements. It was to move rules in the system, which we felt that a fair system would serve the U.S. interests. And in fact, uh, Hull has this big battle uh, with one of his competitors, who unfortunately for the competitor picks Nazi Germany as his barter trade agreement. Roosevelt actually signs off on the agreement, but Hull, with his own political skills, convinces Roosevelt that this won't be so popular back in the United States if Nazi Germany uses its own resources to develop its military. So the, the, the strands, as you said, of these stories keep coming back in, in wonderful ways. Yeah, and, and I like the fact, and you made reference to the Millennium Challenge Corporation, that in many ways all of it comes together because MCC is something that uh, partner countries are interested in because it does provide obviously resources, assistance to do things they might not otherwise be able to do, but it's all based upon their willingness to lower barriers, their willingness to adopt certain principles and show evidence of reform and commitment, again, to the elements of liberty, whether it be transparent governance or citizen responsive governance, so it really does get all tied together. So maybe that's the best expression of both commerce and development. And, well, and, and also this was another one where Senator McCain and I used to work together. A lot of Navy officers did. If you go back and you read the, the, the works of Alfred Thayer Mahan, the great Naval strategist, he was a big believer in, in open trade and influence. And in fact, he said, protectionists are like old ironclads. They're good for defense, but not good for offense. So McCain was a naval strategist as well as a trade strategist. I'm going to open it up here to some questions. And I have uh, this question from um, Michael Polt, Ambassador Polt uh, of the McCain Institute. And he says, most analysts argue that US foreign policy is disastrous at worst and ineffective at best set aside for a moment the recent uh, Middle East deal. What lessons do you draw from our diplomatic history that should inform our foreign policy starting next January? Well, I think um, in some ways, uh, President Trump is the exception that proves the rule. He's sort of a, a historical approach. And what I mean by that is, others have commented on this, it, it's a very transactional foreign policy. So where we've talked about alliances and rules and frameworks, he tends to look at things in a case-by-case deal-making manner. Uh, it obviously relates a lot to his own sense of position and how he gets treated, um, sometimes sad to say more by authoritarians than with his democratic partners. I think also this part isn't unusual, but it, it helps one understand uh, his, his foreign policy is very much connected to his domestic political base. It's, uh, if you think about the wall with Mexico, since we talked about North America, you know, that was one of the uh, kind of ways that he connected with his political supporters from the start. So I always knew that an issue would never go away. So even when he couldn't get funding, he takes it out of the Defense Department because the, he, he couldn't walk away from that. Similarly on trade protectionism, that's another core issue of his base. And then I think he also has a oddity about wanting to be different from his predecessors, whether it's the Bushes or Obamas or Clinton. So where they didn't go, go see the North Korean leader, he would, or, or if they had to deal with Iran, that he'd pull it out. So I think um, as for where it kind of goes, goes from here, Mark, um, one of the challenges is gonna be um, if, if Biden is elected, uh, he's gonna have a heck of a domestic agenda. I mean, he's gonna have uh, a pandemic, he's gonna have inclusive economic recovery, he's got the freight healthcare system, he's got 
racial issues, he's got environmental issues uh, and, and climate change topics. Um, it, it's, a, it's a huge immigration issues. And so, uh, as you know, you can only get so much done in the US system at once. And in fact, whether it was Carter or Clinton or Obama, they have to decide where their priorities are. And if they misjudge it and don't get things done, then they have a problem after their first two years. So I think internationally, one of the ways that uh, President Biden could deal with this would be to leverage off his domestic agenda. If we can do something with dreamers and immigration, well, let's do something with Mexico where the relations have been frayed and frankly, there's some trouble brewing down there economically and politically, including also with Central America. If he does something on the climate change issue, well, don't just go back into Paris, but how can you leverage that with the developing world so you help with soil carbon in Africa for agriculture or avoided deforestation issues? Um, similarly, you know, on, on the economic agenda, what you do at home, we need to get sort of global growth going forward. I, I can imagine that agenda being a good basis for restoring relation with allies. And then also dealing with the fundamental questions of the future of freedom, our free societies, our partners, and how we deal with China. So I think you could, you could draw those back in together, but <clears throat> it will be a big challenge because you know, the expectations will be very high. And you know this from politics, there'll be a fight on the Democratic side because uh, it's not only a question of policy, given Biden's age, it's the future of the party. So he'll need a very disciplined uh, chief of staff and national security advisor to kind of drive these priorities. Right. And, and I think also with due respect to Michael, I think one of the lessons of your book is that we've been here before. And if we look at the interplay of forces, um, yes, uh, President Trump may focus a lot on his base and the politics that drive them, as well as the importance of a growing economy and trade deals um, and, and commerce. These are traditions that have always been at play, just different forces come to bear at different points in our history. So I guess one of your lessons from the book is, it's not a neat progression. We've been here before, and every administration deals with these combination of, of forces and influences. Well, and, and the other part, Mark, that I always want to emphasize, you know, I'm sure you and Congress when we go abroad, is keep in mind the U.S. is more than a president. So uh, it's also a huge dynamic private sector. So this is the summer of the pandemic, but it's also the summer of SpaceX. Um, or while we're having troubles with the WHO from the White House level, the Gates Foundation is making a tremendous contribution, as you know, and I think is the second largest funder. Even within the government, you know, the Federal Reserve's not only helped the US system, but frankly, these swap lines it created at first in the financial crisis have been critical to keeping liquidity going. So like you, I think the American system has a huge resiliency. And because we debate in public, there's a cacophony, it's always struggle, but that's how we come to terms with ourselves. I am a little more worried uh, about the international system because as my books talks about with alliances and economic arrangements, you know, once these fray, they can be harder to put back together. Yeah, and, and again, if we're looking at an interplay of forces, traditions, and influences, we also see um, uh, politics, it's a campaign year, driving some of the president's message. Uh, but at the same time, we have the peace deal, the normalization of relations that just got announced. So on one hand, the president may drive, may again, campaign and poetry, but behind the scenes, he's put together a, a deal that is uh, of historical significance. Well, that one will be interesting going back to this point I made about Charles Evans Hughes, where I don't think you can just see arms control as a technical subject. You have to see it related to regional security. So the, the question here will be whether it can be built on, whether other Arab countries will now come in, whether we can use it in dealing with the challenge of Iran's behavior, not just the nuclear program, and whether you can combine those two together. So that will be the next the challenge for uh, the next stage of diplomacy in the region, whoever is president. And just grouping together several uh, questions that have been sent in, we're also seeing in the Trump administration, 
an increasing focus on building alliances with respect to Iran and with respect to China, the so-called great power competition. So uh, on one hand, the president uh, drives a campaign message in a campaign year. At the same time, his team uh, is working to build some alliances that may be shifting a bit, but deal with important challenges facing the country. Well, we talked a little bit about that in the, the, uh, the Gulf in the Mideast context. I think in the China context, um, we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, you know, we, we, the president has kind of berated the Koreans about what they're supposed to pay for American forces and similar on trade with Japan and Korea. Uh, those countries, as you know, make big contributions, but we never want to treat American forces abroad as if they're mercenaries to be serving there. So I think actually, um, the uh, China's rise and some of the behavior has created an opportunity here to work with India, Australia, Japan, others in the region. But as you know, uh, those countries don't expect to contain China. This can't be a sort of return to the Cold War. So I think we're going to have to be somewhat deft in terms of how we try to put together that coalition. And also, it depends on what you want to accomplish with China. You know, frankly, it's not hard, and this is one of the themes in the book, just to complain about something, but what results do you want to try to accomplish? And I'm not sure we're there yet in our, our directions with, uh, with China. And if we have an interplay of traditions and influences guiding uh, foreign policy, and after November, whether it be President Trump or President Biden, I've got one question here. How do we think American political polarization will affect it? How will that um, either strengthen or, I think by implication, uh, more likely weaken some of our approach to foreign policy in the world? That's a wonderful and very important question. But I'll start with a little historical reference. Late 1945, so this is right after uh, the end of World War II, the American people were polled about the importance of international relations. And I think it was 7% decided that international relations were a priority because they were all interested in reconversion and getting back jobs. And I think in 1946, it rose up to 14%. So this is always a challenge of the leaders of the country to frame it. What I've, what I've also been struck by is the Chicago Council on Global Affairs does these surveys. And if you look at what average Americans are thinking about alliance relationships, trade relationships. Uh, there's the material there to, to engage in the world. Americans are proud of the leadership role. They understand alliance relations. They want to be strong militarily, but they don't want to overuse the power. There's actually much more support for trade than you see in the Congress, because I think interest groups, uh, often protectionists, kind of sort of drive uh, those considerations. And that brings us right back to what you and I were talking about with the Congress. Obviously, the president plays a key leadership role. But as we've seen in key moments here, you know, building support from, from members of Congress, particularly members in the House who've got a fingertip feel for these districts, that's, a, that's an important part. I mean, your background was quite unusual, you know, given in your family and missionary background. But I think maybe with younger members now, some of whom have served in the military or intelligence service, they've engaged international, internationally. The question is, how can we, how can we draw them together uh, to recognize you, you need a different approach for different times? Yeah, I, I'll say just as an editorial comment, I'm actually quite bullish about the Congress. I think as you've just alluded to, there are a number of newer, perhaps more junior members at this time uh, with real practical, oftentimes battlefield experience that make them uh, more likely to reach across the aisle and construct productive solutions to, to uh, some of our, our challenges. Uh, and, you know, at the very time that we talk about American disengagement, we should also point out that under the Trump administration, the U.S. continues to be the largest provider of humanitarian assistance in the world. And when you look at the number of disasters that the U.S. is responding to, in some cases, uh, a record number of disasters, the U.S. under President Trump continues to step forward. Uh, some of that is perhaps uh, 
diplomatic and security interest, but a lot of it is this higher purpose that you've often pointed to in your book. Well, and, and this is one we should also thank Cindy McCain. I know she's taken a strong interest in this, this topic. Uh, but as you know, it also goes to members of Congress. So, you know, Lindsey Graham uh, on the Appropriations Committee may not agree much with Senator Leahy about uh, most topics, but they work pretty well together on the foreign aid topic to your benefit when you're at AID. I've got another question here. Um, and this uh, listener said, you spoke earlier about the education system and the importance of teaching early US political history to students. How do you think the current lack of focus on the topic in many schools has affected the current generation of young new voters? I'll add to that, uh, those who may be considering a career in foreign policy, whether it be as a foreign service officer or in the private sector. Well, um, given my age, I'm probably a little bit out of touch on this, but, but from what I read, I'm always disturbed when I hear that, that uh, younger people, and I, I used to question a lot of the people who would work with me or for me in different roles, when they didn't learn much history. And they, the way history was taught, they seemed to find was boring. Well, the heart of this book is stories. And I try to tell stories in a way that are, uh, catch, or catch people's attention. And I don't know how people can find stories boring if you tell them in the right way. That's what history is about. Um, and so uh, I would like to think, and one of the reasons actually I, I wrote this book is whether for people going into foreign policy or foreign affairs, uh, a lot of this isn't really taught anymore. I've talked to some professors who might use the book for their course, and I've tried to do it in a way as we've discussed that has people, events, sort of uh, practical sense. And uh, in a way, also, since you mentioned policymaking, a lot of what I'm trying to do in the book is to say, how do we try to solve problems? How can we look at history of insights to do better as opposed to timeless obstacles uh, to the advance of, of, of humankind? And I guess one other point on that is history, people often draw analogies and that's, those, that's natural to do. But I tend to have found history to be more useful in thinking of questions to ask. You know, how did people try this before? What was the perspective of other countries on, on their history? If you're dealing with China today, you, you can't work effectively with China unless you have a sense of how China views its past, whether we feel it's sort of accurate or not, or my story about Germany and Europe at the time of unification. So I think that history, in a sense, broadens the outlook, including history of other countries. You, you grew up abroad in part, so you had this feeling, but you know, I tried to study a little bit of history of other countries, and uh, it gives you questions to ask other people. And particularly since many people feel Americans don't know much about their country, boy, you get added points for just knowing a little bit about their, their background. So I've got one last question here. And really it's a, a corollary or, or uh, a variation of the one we just asked. Based on your experience, what advice would you provide to a college student who is looking to go into foreign policy? What's your advice? Well, study history <laughs> for the reasons we said. Do you know any the, great historical works that might be available? Well, other than, well you could start with mine. Uh, <laughs> but, then, but then on top of it, uh, I, I'll offer some other thoughts that people might find a little bit unusual. But I've had a number of people over the years, and a number of people who work with me have come out to run their own institutions. Now, the head of the IMF used to work for me, the head of the UN Environmental Program, the African woman who runs the African Commission on Africa. So there's some history here. And that is, um, pick who you work for. Now this may sound odd because most people think their bosses pick them, which they do. But my point is, you don't have to agree with every, the person on everything, but you learn an awful lot from, from the right person. And here again, I think about Senator McCain. I, you know, I run into his former staffers all over in different sort of contexts and the tremendous experience they've had. And a related part is when you're working for someone, try to put yourself in the shoes of that person and try to think how the, the questions that person has to face. And you'll find that number one, um, you're more helpful because you see it from their perspective as opposed to what you're trying to do. And there's a nice beneficiary, which is if you start to think like a decision maker, you're more likely to become one because you operate in those terms. And so what you can use history about is kind of the case studies to learn about decision-making. 
I'm going to wind down here with a, uh, a quote. In fact, it's the final part of your book. Final paragraph, you say, I expect America's leaders and citizens will continue to pursue these challenges pragmatically, trying what works. As Tocqueville observed more than two centuries ago, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. That seems like a pretty good way to wrap up all that we've been talking about. Bob, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Great uh, luck with this book. Uh, I think it's marvelous. I had a chance to read it last week. You're right, it is character driven. Uh, lots of wonderful stories, lots of great characters. And somehow through it all, we end up to being America and America being the leader that it is on the world stage. To those who are listening, I hope you enjoyed our first book discussion. There are many more to come. Keep an eye out on our social media platforms at McCain Institute on Instagram and Twitter for our next event of the Authors and Insights series. Again, Bob, thanks very much and so long to everyone. Thank you. And congratulations. Good luck with the McCain Institute, Mark. And thanks to Cindy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.